In this lesson, we're going to be examining an introduction to graphing of quadratic functions, and specifically we're going to be looking at how to graph functions that come out in the form of ax squared. Well, for this, a quadratic function is any function that is nonlinear and can be written with a standard form of y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Now you can see there's a lot going on here. Today we're just focusing on this ax squared part. Other parts of what the c and the bx do will come in later lessons. Now the function itself, when you graph it, has the shape of what is called a parabola. So a parabola is simply this shape that you see graphed here, where it comes down, turns, and then returns back up in the direction it was headed. This is a standard y equals uh, 1x squared graph, and so we can make changes and manipulations to it, just like we can from any linear function that we've seen in the past. Some key points of interest in this function. The first is the axis of symmetry. And this is simply a vertical line that can divide our parabola into two equal symmetric parts. And for this standard graph, the y-axis acts as our axis of symmetry, as I attempt to draw one here. And you can see that from the left and right, it folds perfectly across this dotted line that was drawn. Next is our vertex, which is the turning point of the graph. And the vertex for this function currently is located at the origin. So the vertex, its equation would be y, or x equals 0. That's the equation of the y-axis. And the vertex is a location, a point, and its point would be 0, 0. So wherever the graph turns around at is the vertex, and the line that you could fold it across and get the same on either side is our axis of symmetry. Basic graph, parabola, and quadratic function has that equation of y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Let's take a look at a couple of other quadratic functions and see if we can identify some of these key points in them. So shown here are those two functions that were promised. And let's see if we can find that axis of symmetry. A lot of times I will abbreviate that as AOS. And then the vertex. Remember, axis of symmetry is an equation. The vertex is a specific point. So for our first function that is shown here, what do we have for our vertex first? Where is the turning point of this function? And if you look, it turns around at this location here. So if I put an extra dot there as a reminder, I find that my vertex is located at the coordinate 2, negative 3. Now, what about that axis of symmetry? Well, the axis of symmetry is the vertical line that passes directly through that vertex, so it's going to have AOS, the equation x equals 2. Note that the x part of the vertex is the equation for the line signifying the axis of symmetry. Let's take a look at our second function. Again, we have this axis of symmetry in here that will make everything equal across the two sides, but it all comes down to where that vertex is. And we can see the vertex is this high point right here. So if I circle it in a color that can be seen a little better, what's the location of that? Well, our vertex this time is located at the point negative 3, 7. And then our actual axis of symmetry is the vertical line that passes through that. Our AOS is x equals negative 3. Now, a thing of note, and this will become very important as we move forward 
in our study of quadratics and quadratic functions is that some key points that are always being discussed when it comes to quadratics is a starting point, which a lot of times means the y-axis or the y-intercept, solutions, which is where it crosses the x-axis, or a maximum or minimum value that is achieved. Well, for both maximum and minimum value, that happens at the vertex. We can manipulate our parabola, our quadratic function, so that it opens up, in which case we will have a minimum value. We can also manipulate the equation so that it opens down, in which case that vertex acts as a maximum value. So be sure you have ways of locating this visually, graphically, and then also as we continue with our studies we will look at how to identify these points or calculate them algebraically. So we have these two main functions, one that opens up and one that opens down. How do we really tell the difference between them? Well, when we write our equation, y equals ax squared, or f of x equals ax squared, we have two main situations. We can have either a being greater than zero, or we can have a being less than zero. If a is greater than zero, it opens up. And along with the fact that this opens up, we will also have, as I just said, a minimum value. So if it opens up and has a minimum value, how exactly does this graph look? Well, if I were to graph the function y equals 1x squared, it would have its vertex at the origin, and then whatever movement I make away from that origin, I'm going to square it for my vertical value. For instance, if I move to the right one, what would 1 squared be? Well, 1 squared is 1, and I get a point here. If I were to move to the left one at negative 1 and square negative 1, well, negative 1 times a negative 1 is a positive 1, and I end up there. If I move to the right 2, I'll be on this vertical line. And what is 2 squared? 2 squared is 4. So I end up here. And if I move to the left 2, negative 2 squared is also a positive 4. So I end here. And it gives me enough to do a basic graph of my function, which is what we saw on the first slide. But what happens if I start to change this a little? And let's say I want to do y equals 2x squared. Well, now according to my order of operations, whatever movements I do to the right or left, I will square that and then double my answer. So again, if I move to the right one, I'm on this line. 1 squared is 1. 1 times 2 comes out as 2. If I move to the left one, negative 1 squared is 1 times 2 is also 2. Now what happens if I move to the right two spaces? Well, 2 squared is 4. 4 times 2 would give me 8, and that will put me just off the top of my graph that's shown. If I move to the left two, negative 2 squared is also 4. 4 times 2 is also 8. So I end up here. Connecting these points, of course, still going through the origin, I end up with a graph that looks a lot like the first, it's just taller. So any time my A value is positive, it will open up. If I have an A value that's greater than 1, it's going to be a very tall graph that opens up. If I were to have one that was y equals 1 half x squared, each time I'd move up only half the distance, and I would end up with a graph that is much wider than the standard that I'm used to. So I'd end up with something that looks more or less like this yellow graph. 
So I can get a whole series of graphs that all open up. It's just a matter of how quickly they're moving up, and that is controlled by that lead coefficient. So this last one is y equals 1 half x squared. Well, what happens if a is negative? So let's take a look at y equals a negative 1x squared. So I still have my point at the origin. And if I substitute in a positive 1, 1 squared is 1. And then I multiply that 1 by this negative, And I get out negative 1. If I put in a negative 1, negative 1 squared is also 1. 1 times negative 1 gives me a negative 1. If I substitute in a 2, I'll be on this vertical line. 2 squared is 4. 4 times negative 1 will get me negative 4. And negative 2 squared is 4 times negative 1 is negative 1. And I get a graph that looks roughly like this. Notice that the sides are curved. They are not perfectly straight. But also notice that this black line that was just drawn is simply the red line reflected over the x-axis. The title of this slide is Vertical Stretch, which is controlled by that lead number, how big is it, and Reflection. If that lead number is negative, it will reflect across the x-axis. So if I were to graph a negative 2x squared, I would end up with something that looked just like my blue line before, except opening down. So I would come out to here and here, and I would get a graph that looks a lot like this. If I did a negative 1 half x squared, y equals negative 1 half x squared, it would look a lot like the orange line, except it opens up at half the speed. And I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get this to show up on, but a rough picture of it. Let me do that in another color, the same orange that I had before. So whether it opens up or down is controlled by whether the lead coefficient is positive or negative, and then how quickly it opens will be controlled by what that number actually is. Let's practice graphing some. Okay, so our first function we're going to graph will be y equals negative 3x squared. So for this, I'm going to build a table of values, x and y. I'm going to put 0 in the center of my table, and then use my order of operations. According to this, I'm going to take whatever x is and square it, and multiply by negative 3. So 0 squared is 0. 0 times negative 3 is also 0. Gives me a point right at the origin. That will establish my vertex and my axis of symmetry. The axis of symmetry is x equals 0. My vertex is that point zero, 0. Next, I'll use 1 and 2, negative 1 and negative 2. If I substitute in 1 to my function, 1 squared is 1. 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. So I get a point located about here. Next, if I substitute in a 2, 2 squared is 4. 4 times negative 3 is negative 12, which is going to be well off my graph. If I substitute in a negative 1, negative 1 squared is 1. 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. And if I substitute in negative 2, negative 2 squared is 4. 4 times negative 3 is negative 12. So I end up with points here, and then again, very low off the end of my graph. So I can't quite make it over to my number 2 line on either side, but I can connect in these few points that I do have. And that's a rough sketch of what y equals negative 3x squared would look like. Next, let's try graphing y equals 2 thirds x squared. So again, I'm going to do this by establishing a table of values, x and y. 0, 
will go into the center of my function, and we know that that will come out to 0. Next, negative 2, negative 1, 1, and 2. If I substitute a 1 in, 1 squared is 1, times 2 thirds gets me an output of 2 thirds. Next, if I put a negative 1 in, negative 1 squared is again 1, times 2 thirds is a positive 2 thirds. So plotting points so far, I have 0, 0, 1, 2 thirds, and negative 1, 2 thirds. Although I should put those up as 2 thirds and not at negative 2 thirds. So let me get those corrected here. Okay, next, what happens if I substitute in a 2 from my x list? 2 squared is 4. 4 times 2 thirds would be 8 thirds. And if I convert 8 thirds into a mixed number, that is 2 and 2 thirds. So I get 2 and 2 thirds. If I substitute in the negative 2 thirds, uh, the negative 2 into my function, it will have the same effect because when I square it, it gets rid of the negative sign. So I end up with a positive 2 and 2 thirds here as well. So at 2, I'm at 2 and 2 thirds, just below the 3 line. And at negative 2, I'm at 2 and 2 thirds, again, just below the 3 line. So if I go through and connect these points, I will end up with a function that looks kind of like that. So again, it does stay curved. It is not straight on both sides. That lead value tells us how quickly it opens up, but is not exactly the equivalent of having a slope. So be paying attention that you're not using a ruler or a straight edge to connect these. They do have some amount of curve to them. So this is our basic introduction into graphing of quadratic functions. We will develop more and start looking at other forms that these can take as we move forward in our study of algebra. So make sure you have some good notes off this and are able to reproduce it or uh, do it on your own or ask questions if you have them.